So here's an hour of the, for the atmosphere. And what we'll start with is some stuff I've already talked about a little bit, the, um, uh, how you measure atmospheric optical depth. There's basically uh, two, two methods. Uh, one are sun photometers, such as the microtops that you have here. And uh, you've all gotten experience playing with that. Um, the other sun photometer that's uh, out there a lot is CIMO, the CIMO instrument, which is autonomous. And I'll talk about that more toward the end. If uh, you're going to see for a long period of time, I, I, there's a bunch of extra information in here that if you have, keep it, you can keep it for a reference. One is this um, at the Aeronet site. And so here's the Aeronet uh, um, address. There's a maritime aerosol network, the MAN network, that uh, started, was started by Sasha Smirnoff in the uh, Aeronet group. And basically, if you have a microtops and you're going to see, he's trying to get as much data as he can at the sea. Because the normal CMOL instrument, as I'll show you, requires a stable platform so it doesn't work at sea. So he's um, basically trying to get as much data as he can get. So if you have a microtops, you can send it to him beforehand. He'll calibrate it and get it up to speed for you. If you don't have one and you're going to see for a long time, I would try to contact him at, um, through that network. And he probably can get you one to borrow to use at sea while you're out there. OK, so the, um, he's working really hard to get as much data as he can at sea over the, in the water. Anyway, so the sun photometer. The microtops, two degree field of view around the sun. Um, the sun's only a half a degree inside there, so it gives you a little slop. Um, I yeah. Comment on this measurement of optical depth. I had some formula or something for aerosol optical depths, and you know I was plugging my wavelengths into it in atmospheric conditions and whatever, and it was kind of getting these weird numbers, and I. Yeah, I mean, this, the CMOL instruments uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, um, their accuracy is expected. They think they're getting um, 0.01 in optical depth, um, maybe even 0.005. Um, the microtops, it depends on the operator a bunch and how careful they are excluding clouds and things like that. But you can probably get within 0.02 or point. O2 in optical depth. Um, I'm a factor of two. I'm not sure. Like I say, this was eight or ten years ago, long before these things, but yeah. it was just like I, like I say, I found this formula, I plugged the numbers into it. They were like a factor of two different from Howard's numbers or something, and he just, he was not at all surprised. Yeah, huh. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that, like I say, the, you should be able to get within. 0.02 or something with this if it's been calibrated recently and such. Um, the other way to get it, optical depth is with something called a shadow band radiometer. And with that, um, basically what you have is an irradiance collector um, that measures the full sky downwelling irradiance. And then you have this little shadow band that goes and blocks the sun. And so by looking at um, the total minus the diffuse sky part, you get what was the direct solar uh, component. Um, what you want for to do the uh, sun photometry is the direct, remember we pointed the instrument at the sun, so you want the direct solar radiance. And so when you get this measurement, which is a planar measurement, you need to divide by the co cosine of the solar zenith angle to get back to here. 
The problem with that is um, at larger solar zenith angles, this becomes a, a fairly small number. And so you're multiplying or you're dividing this term by a small number. So little errors can really magnify in that, which is why um, this is basically still a land-based instrument and they have to do a correction for the cosine response and all the different angles. But this is a different way to do it. And there was a person um, at um, oh, Brookhaven that uh, tried to, Mark Miller and um, Michael Reynolds tried to do, build one that would work at sea um, to, for ver with various success. Anyway, but most of the people now are measuring mic with that handheld microtops optical depth. Either way you do it, this is the equation I showed you before. Um, you the you just have the um, optical depth, total optical depth, the air mass. This is your calibration coefficient in instrument units. This is what you measure that time, and so you can convert it to optical depth in that way. Uh, we already saw that. Um, just to give you a couple equations, uh, I told you the air mass is 1 over cosine theta. That's this black line here. A little fancier equation is up here, um, and that's the red line. And this accounts for Earth curvature. So if you're measuring the optical depth at very low sun angles, the curvature of the Earth matters uh, the way the atmosphere works. Um, but you can see that it doesn't matter until you're above about 75 degrees or so. So now you have it in your notes, the fancier equation, if you happen to do that. Now, the optical depth that we've been measuring we, uh, that um, Jason reported the other day is the total optical depth. So that's composed of the Rayleigh optical depth plus gas absorption plus aerosol optical depth. Um, Rayleigh is molecular. It's very well known. For the most part, every, one, every five years, somebody comes out has a small correction. But this is very well known. The gas absorption um, are things like ozone and water vapor. And you try to avoid them as much as you can, unless you're trying to measure that gas. And the residual between these two things is the aerosol optical depth. And aerosols are highly variable. And that's usually what we're trying to get at with the sun photometry is what the aerosol optical depth is because it varies strongly with location, distance from the source, what's gone on between the source and, and where you are and such. And it's the sort of the unknown in the climate modeling world. Um, so Rayleigh optical depth falls off as lambda to the minus four. Here's the fanciest equation I could, or the most recent equation I could find um, it's supposed to be accurate to within two ten or two hundredths of a percent for the Rayleigh optical depth. For the, uh, I've got the microtops wavelengths. You have 380, 440, 500, 675, and 870. And here's um, the Rayleigh optical depth that I scaled to the pressure that we had on the on Wednesday during the the um, cruise. This equation is is for one point well, 1013 uh, millibars. Um, the microtops that we have gives you the pressure, so you can s get that to scale, the really optical depth. And it's lambda to the minus 4, so it's a nice smooth curve. Um, the other component that's important when we're measuring optical depth in the visible is ozone. Um, if you want to measure ozone, there's another, you can measure it with some photometry, but you use wavelengths down at 300 and to 310 nanometers where ozone really strongly absorbs. But in the visible, um, ozone's still there. And to correct your optical depth measurement to get the aerosol optical depth, you basically um, have to figure out how much the ozone optical depth is. And so you go to, there's these climatologies they have based on um, Based on the AMI, the ozone monitoring instrument, and other, uh, the microwave limb sounder um, satellite instrument. And basically, they have a, whatever uh, climatology you want, there's, 
the ozone varies with both latitude. Um, the table that I got from this paper goes in the southern hemisphere, but I didn't worry about it. Um, and it also varies by season. And if you look, what typically happens is ozone in the winter is fairly high levels, column ozone in um, the northern latitudes where there's not much sun, um, and it decreases toward uh, whoop, January, February. Yeah, so it decreases from there into the summer and then starts increasing again, obviously, in the winter as the sun goes away. In the lower latitudes, uh, the ozone's always fairly low because there's always a lot of sunlight. And uh, what you're getting is the ozone, the um, sunlight photo disassociates oxygen, creating ozone, and also takes ozone and converts it back to oxygen. Um, so by having the sunlight, you get this, it's sort of a balance between creation and destruction. So what I, want, what I wanted to really point out was that there are these climatologies you can get to predict how much ozone is there above you. Um, for our day, we had about 308 uh, Dobson units. A Dobson unit is sort of a weird unit. Um, it, the instrument that they came up with to measure uh, ozone for a while was a Dobson radiometer, so that's, I, I'm not sure where exactly the Dobson unit came in. A Dobson unit, so Dobson, is one milli atmosphere centimeter. Okay, so that's a really obvious number, right? What, what that means is if you have a column of, let's concentrate on the atmosphere centimeter part. If you have a column of air and you concentrated all the ozone that was in, or all the whatever that you're talking about, but we'll talk about ozone, if you, call it, you concentrated all the ozone into this column, in this column of air, down into the bottom, okay, then uh, one, milli, one atmosphere centimeter would mean that the, all of the ozone in here concentrated at the bottom would take up a layer one centimeter thick at standard temp at STP, at standard temperature and pressure. Okay? Is that, con that a weird enough unit for you? So uh, a Dobson unit, though, because Dobson units, typical ozone numbers are like 300 over our... Cruise, it was about 308, guessing from that uh, climatology. Um, so that means that uh, above us, if we took all the ozone above us, concentrated it down, it would be three millimeters of ozone here at the surface, okay? So that's how these atmosphere centered, these uh, units work, anyway. So if you look um, for our measurement wavelengths, the ozone um, doesn't matter at 380 nanometers, and it's only at 500 to 675, it's about a 0.01 optical depth. So if I combine those things, we have the Rayleigh optical depth, you have the ozone optical depth, and you can take that and combine it with our measurements and so here's the, st here's the Rayleigh, here's the ozone. Note that the ozone optical depth is increasing tremendously back here, which is where you want to measure if you want to measure ozone. Notice that the peak in the ozone is over here around 600 nanometers, which is, we have a measurement at 500 and 670. We avoid this region because of this ozone peak. Um, and so this is the data that uh, Jason gave you the other day. If you subtract off um, the Rayleigh optical depth from that, the ozone optical depth from that, this is now the aerosol optical depth, the remainder of the two things, okay? So let's do the aerosols. Um, just like you had when we were talking about the spectral variation of uh, beam attenuation with um, Aerosols, you expect that it's going to follow the Angstrom law. In fact, it started with 
uh, studying aerosols rather than in ocean optics. Um, and so there's a reason to expect it to follow some relationship like this. And so I've plotted here the, the aerosol optical depth that we measured on Wednesday versus a fit that I did. So we had an, this component up here now is called the angstrom exponent. Um, my, well, it's minus the angstrom exponent the way it's written there, so 2.3. What you typically expect is over the ocean is to have an angstrom exponent that's about um, either between zero and one. Um, this is a little bit stronger indicating that there's more smaller particles. You tend to get that in uh, more polluted um, or more coastal environments where there was some pollution. Um, generally, if it you, ne you never see it less than, almost never see it less than zero. So if you've, you're doing this and you get a number less than zero, you've got to worry about it. 2.3 is pretty strong, so I'm, um, I don't really understand why it was quite that big. But that's what we got during our measurement. So does that make sense to people? You measure the aerosol optical depth, you subtract off the Rayleigh, which you can calculate really accurately, you estimate the ozone and take that out, and the residual then is this aerosol optical depth, the number that you really want with the microtops. Um, we, they mentioned the other day uh, nitrogen dioxide being uh, important when, um, when Jeremy was talking about uh, the atmospheric correction process. And for a little while, there was this, Glenn Shaw um, brought it up that maybe it was important when you're doing optical depth measurements with sun photometry. Um, I just sort of include this in here. What he estimated was that um, for if you had NO2 values on the order of 0.4 atmosphere centimeters, that's 400 Dobson units. Um, then the optical depth due to uh, aerosol or nitrogen dioxide absorption could be as big as 0.09. And so he thought we needed to worry about it for optical depth measurements. Here's some data I found recently, or I found that had been come out recently, 2014, that gives you sort of the numbers that you could expect for Dobson units um, for different environments. For oceanic environments, instead of 400, we're talking about really about 0.4, between 0.1 and 0.4. Continental, 0.4 to 0.8. Suburban, 0.8 to 3. Um, this is a pollution NOx. It's a um, it's a pollution gas, so uh, it's only going to be really strong around areas of heavy pollution. Um, and at the end, I'll talk about why it's important for atmospheric correction, perhaps. But in general, these numbers are way smaller. So in, in, for sun photometry, you really don't have to worry about the um, nitrogen dioxide gas. So a very busy thing. Um, what I wanted to get you out of this is, OK, so we've done sun photometry. The other thing is to look at how the things you've learned about the ocean optics works in terms of the atmosphere. And uh, Emmanuel has mentioned several times that the atmosphere guys seem to be way ahead of us in terms of doing things in the, um, than we're doing in the ocean. Here's two, um, the thin line here is the um, extinction profile through the atmosphere uh, over the ocean for a Northern Hemisphere clean station. And this is a station that had dust coming, blowing over. This is from a cruise that went from Norfolk, Virginia down to South Africa. Um, so the thin line here is the extinction derived from LIDAR. Here's the uh, coefficient. It didn't come out very clearly. But the typical extinction numbers, when we're working in in open ocean, you think of a, a beam attenuation on the order of uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, whatever inverse meters. Out here, what was our extinction coefficients? It was 
the beam attenuations were point, point 0.2, point 0.3 is all out in the Deary, out here, the, yeah, yeah, I would expect it'd be almost two or, or higher. Anyway, it's two per meter. If you look, um, the peak here is 0.15 inverse kilometers, okay? So it's a completely different scale of scattering. If you go um, into a dust environment, we're still talking 0.1 to 0.3 um, inverse kilometers. So the atmosphere, obviously, we can see much farther in the, in the atmosphere than in the ocean. So. Uh, one advantage the atmospheric people have is that um, since the extinction is so low, most of the time what they're looking at is single scattering events. They're not looking at multiple scattering events. So that helps them do their, their inversions. Uh, the, weather, the way you measure extinction in the atmosphere is either with a long path length transosometer, like between mountains, um, or with something like a LIDAR, and what a LIDAR is like a radar, it, um, what you have is the LIDAR, it sends a light signal up. As the signal's going up to some layer, it's attenuated on the way up. It's backscattered by aerosols and molecules there, and then it comes back down and attenuated again on the way down. And by sending a pulse up and measuring the time that it takes for it to come back, you get basically a profile of the backscattering involved with the, um, the extinction along the two paths. So in general with a LIDAR, what you end up with is this signal that is a combination of backscattering and extinction. You have to figure out a way to separate the two things. So that's how we got uh, that data. Um, LIDARs are are coming up a lot in our field because um, they're talking about, well, we're doing experiments with some of the atmospheric people who have LIDARs. Uh, this is an example from the Sabre experiment that Ivana sent me. Um, and it was the high resolution spectral LIDAR. Here's it, so it's flying and it's measuring the atmosphere below it. And then now we're talking, people are talking about how much of the ocean you can get in the measurement. So here's, um, this is the surface, and, and this scale is kilometers. Now this is in meters. This is below the surface and uh, looking at high backscattering layers. Now the problem is, is your, your resolution with the LIDAR is limited by the pulse length, right? Because um, you're, you're trying to determine the height by the return time of the signal. So you have to have a short pulse uh, and then measure at high frequency the signal coming back to get any kind of height resolution. I think on this graph I tell you for a 25 meter resolution in the atmosphere you need to have about a, a tenth of a microsecond for your transmit and receive roughly. So to get 25 meter resolution you need to be have a short pulse and, and, quit and high s temporal resolution in the receiving channel. How much does um, atmosphere mess it up? Because I think some of that, if this is something that goes up in Maine, and it's going to be it, it doesn't mess it up in terms of, it, a LIDAR is just like, ocean color. It can't see through clouds. Um, so, to p you know, if, if you're up here and in space or in this airplane looking down and you have a strong return here from this cloud or this uh, smoke plume or whatever it would be here, um, that leaves you less signal to get down <laughs> into the water. So it's sort of integrated of the extinction all the way down to see how much signal you have left to go down. Yeah, Emmanuel. It, it still works in, it's, it works better than that and it also works at night. Yes. Um, so you can get the measurements at night. Um, we actually were looking at with our ground light, I have a ground LIDAR in, in um, 
at, in Miami, and we were looking at using it to measure cloud optical depths. And even with this low-powered LIDAR, we could see through about one optical depth of cloud. Beyond that, we couldn't see much. This high spectral resolution LIDAR is sort of cool, very cool actually, um, because if you look at, um, so here is wavelength going this way. Um, if you look at this uh, backscattering from the LIDAR, if you have very high spectral resolution, what you'll see is you'll have a center peak and then two peaks on either side. What they do with this high spectral resolution LIDAR is they send the, the um, signal out, the laser out, the LIDAR signal out, is locked onto an atomic vapor line. So it's very, very precisely determined. So it's like right here at this wavelength. The signal return ends up being split between these three peaks. The center peak is the aerosol part. And these two parts are the Rayleigh part, uh, the molecular backscattering. The cool thing there is you can calculate what the backscattering in the atmosphere should be, the profile of the backscattering due to Rayleigh scattering, really accurately. And so by looking at the Rayleigh part, where you know the backscattering really well, you can, um, by looking at the return from here, you get an independent measurement of the extinction. So this gives you extinction along the path. And so um, in the normal LIDAR problem of having this convolution between extinction and backscattering gets sort of eliminated because you can use these parts to look at extinction, and then this part will give you the backscattering for the aerosols. So your LIDAR is putting out those three wavelengths? No, the, the LIDAR is putting out this wavelength. So you're locked here at some... Um, molecular okay, so then gas, atomic gas. Side bands? So, what these are the Brillouin scattering okay. in the atmosphere, and so you can actually, if you really want to get, or if you can get fancy enough, not only can you do this separation and sort of self-calibrate your lidar by looking at this separation, you get an idea of the temperature profile of the atmosphere. Also, mm -hmm. so it's pretty cool. Um, I, I talked about it for a second um, for in the ocean, but not really in the atmosphere. In the ocean, ends up that the um, Brillouin um, peaks are much closer than they are in the atmosphere. It's a little bit easier to do it in the atmosphere than the ocean. Although I did mention that uh, the guy, Thomas Walter, is doing it in the Ocean. Anyway, so this high spectral resolution LIDAR is a pretty, a pretty neat system um, because of that being able to self calibrate like that. And uh, we're at. What's that? It's backscatter coefficient, inverse kilometers, inverse stradians. Yeah, yeah. So it's the back. It is. It's not the total backscattering we think of. It's the volume scattering coefficient at 180 degrees. Um, anyway, what in terms of vertical resolution, though, 25 meters in the atmosphere is 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 great. You don't need much more because that's the scales and the what's going on in the atmosphere. That's a reasonable number. When we talk about the ocean, though, uh, 25 meters. Uh, doesn't do as much for you. So um, need to, to get higher uh, resolution in the ocean, what you need to do is get those pulse lengths shorter and the measurement frequencies higher. Anything else on that you wanted to, we should say? Well, think about it in our degree. I mean, directly we're very limited with active sensors, with passive sensors. Yesterday, 
and you run Hydrolyte. And Hydrolyte says, I need the number for the backscatter. So you put in whatever. But this whole community, they don't care about backscattering over 90 to 180 degrees. Their, quote, backscatter, unquote, is as Emmanuel just said, it's, it's the volume scattering function at 180 degrees. So a lot of mean codes, for example, will put out a number that's called backscatter, but it's really the volume scattering function at 180. It's not integrated from 90 to 180. And you can like spend three days before you finally figure that out, trying to get you know one backscatter number to agree with another one. But really, they're apples and oranges. Yes, so if you use the, if you go back to the book by Boyd and Offman and use their code, they have a backscattering. That is an output. It's not the same thing we call backscatter. And you'll also see this called the radar backscatter by some people. Um, there was, there is talk. I still, I think about using putting a lidar on with ACE, right? That's yes. still with ACE, and so that with the ACE mission, you'd have the lidar, even if the ocean part didn't work real well, which it, it does give you data. It gives you the vertical distribution of the aerosols, which should be able to help with the atmospheric correction process. So. Um, Hmm. With LIDAR with, combined with ocean color or without? Uh, the, I mean, the, it's for atmosphere, but there are people that are pushing them to be able to be also useful. There's been a, a satellite Calypso um, a mission that has a, a LIDAR on it um, that's been measuring atmosphere. And For ocean? Uh, if you integrate that 40 mm -hmm. meter or 25 meter beam, you get something that's very consistent with that scanning as we expect. Mm -hmm. The thing with the LIDAR system in general, we're, we're used to like uh, one kilometer pixels and you know a thousand pixels, so a thousand kilometer swaths. These LIDARs are basically right underneath the instrument flying along. You don't get a big swath of it. Um, you get the pencil along the path of the satellite. Um, okay, so in some ways the atmosphere is easier because you can, you have single scattering a lot of times. Um, other ways it's way harder. Um, aerosol absorption, there's all these techniques to measure aerosol absorption. Um, you, to try to concentrate it, you can uh, have high volume uh, filter, you basically you filter all day air through a small filter to try to get enough aerosols so you can make a measurable signal. And then you can measure the reflectance or the transmittance just like we did with our filter bed um, absorption measurements here. Um, so you can try this. You can measure the direct and diffuse sky irradiance. Um, and by looking at the diffuse sky irradiance, you figure out what was missing. And um, by looking at the missing part, you try to guess how much um, absorption happen in the atmosphere. Um, there's then the more, the fancier things, a ring laser. So you have a, a laser that's, uh, the laser cavity is open and you can put the air through part of the laser cavity and, and that ends up being a very sensitive uh, measure of losses inside the signal. It's a pretty cool high-tech method. Um, there's photoacoustics. If you're we haven't mentioned photoacoustics at all. Photoacoustics, Alexander Graham Bell discovered it. Basically, it's the idea that if you shine light, a pulse of light onto a surface, um, if it absorbs, when it absorbs, typically most of the energy goes off into heat. If something heats, what happens to it? It gets smaller or larger or something, right? It expands. And so by measuring, when you shine a light on, a short pulse of light on, onto an object, it absorbs, it expands a little bit. When it expands, it sends out a pressure wave, which is basically sound. So by measuring the sound wave coming off something, you get a measure of the uh, absorption of the, of the object. Um, and so they talk about using, they use photoacoustics to a certain extent to try to measure aerosol absorption. The main thing to point out here is that there's all these techniques 
none of the techniques give you the same answer um, and it's sort of a relative mess in terms of how much absorption there is in the atmosphere of the aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, there isn't just one technique that everybody uses because um, it's just hard to do. It goes back to that idea that the extinction is measured on the order of a tenth of a kilometer and the absorption is probably only a tenth of the total extinction. So it's a very small number. But important number because it, it determines a lot of the radiation balance stuff. So one of the uh, really great resources for the atmospheric community you've heard about already <coughs> is Aeronet. Um, here's a picture of an Aeronet station with a satellite transmitter and a solar panel to, panel to power the whole thing and then the little robot SEMOL sun photometer sky radiometer. Um, they have lots of them all over the place on land. Um, now th this is from their website. Uh, not all these stations are active all the time but um, there's a huge distribution of data that you can get just download from the site. Um, yeah. Regarding what you just said before, with respect to aerosol absorption and radiation, it's one of the biggest uncertainties in climate, uh, in, in, in climate forcing, whether aerosol absorb and contribute to increasing absorption or whether they scatter more light back to the atmosphere. And so this is one of the, and whenever people from aerosol community present, they always convict, you know, the first thing is to say this is this is the big unknown. This of course, unknown. of course, when the cloud guys get up, they say <laughs> that the clouds are the big unknown. And so everybody wants their, well, the oceans guys get up, or the ocean biologists, or the carbon sink in the oceans is the great unknown, or the coastal region, or whatever. Everybody wants to be the great unknown for the climate. Do you know why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're right. I mean, the, they will, that is true. When that's the way you justify all the aerosol. It is unknown. It, the IPCC report, it's one of the biggest uncertainties is, is in aerosol and the rate of effect of aerosols. The problem with, as I s tried to say, and I'm not doing the best job here, um, the aerosols in, um, they hang out mostly in the lower, I'll show a prof I showed a profile a bit ago. If you look where the aerosols are, they're down here in the first kilometer or so for the most part, first one or two kilometers. And there's another atmospheric effect that happens there, which is called rain. And so basically, the distance from a, um, as a rain event happens with these aerosols, it can clean out the aerosols and you get what's called wet deposition. But basically, the aerosol abundance varies very strongly uh, with distance from the source, with what's gone on to the aerosol from the source. So it, it's not simple like, um, like CO2 in the atmosphere and such, which, which is more globally averaged. So, okay, what do I want to say here? So here's a picture of the SEMO a little closer. It has the standard SEMO comes with all these channels. It measures the direct solar radiance and the almucantor. Now, the almucantor is um, the, it basically if you look um, at the sun, at the zenith angle of the sun, the almucantor is a collection of angles all the way around at that same zenith angle at different azimuthal angles, okay? The reason the almucantor is sort of cool is that um, if you look, if you have this, if you're looking along the almucantor, you have the same path length through the atmosphere the whole way around. All right, because you have this, it's the same zenith angle. And so some, um, it, particularly when people were trying to come up with easy ways to um, look at optical properties before computers and better rate of transfer stuff, um, that adds some simplification. The other measurement they do of sky radiance is the principal plane. And the principal plane is the one that contains the zenith and the sun direction. So if the sun's over here, the principal plane is uh, these collection of different angles in that direction. The almucantor, it's, if the sun's here, it's the collection like that. So it measures sky radiance along those two directions at uh, four of the wavelengths. Um, I think 10, 20, 870, 
675 and 440. So uh, measurement frequency, it measures the direct solar irradiance um, at least every 15 minutes through the day and it measures these Almucantor measure time at four different times in the morning and the afternoon. That's all you need out of there. The neat thing is with, this, um, with sky radiance inversions, you can get a measure of the phase function of the atmosphere. Okay? And once you have the phase function of the atmosphere, you can try to then convert that into different aerosol properties, like size distribution of the aerosol and such. Um, so there's, I gave um, Ali, or I tried to, there's these papers. So I've, I have, whenever I have the reference up here, I will try to put the paper on your site. Um, this is a paper, Dubovic, Oleg Dubovic and uh, Michael King, uh, describing the aerosol inversion they have. Um, basically, it retrieves the real part of the index refract, or the total index refraction constrained between 1.3 and 1.6, and the imaginary part between 0 0.005, basically 0, and, and 0.5, and uh, a size range. The atmosphere has an advantage over the ocean in a way that if something gets too big, it just falls out quickly. So there's, and, and particles aren't, end up not being too, you know, there's a, a fairly, const fairly constrained size range for what particles can, aerosols can be in the atmosphere. So in terms of this inversion, they assume that the radius of the aerosol is between 0.05 and 15 microns. And this inversion retrieves two, 22 sizes um, in this size range. And they retrieve the index refraction uh, spectrally. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, I can't spell accuracy. Okay, so um, anyway, this is a table that's in there so that you can see the accuracy of, the inver of this inversion. And the idea is that um, the size you can get pretty well within 15, well, for size, small sizes, you get it within 15 to 35, 30%. Um, for the large sizes, between 15 and 100%. Um, the 100% is because when you get to the large particles, there's not very many of them, and so the error is a little bit bigger there. Um, for the index refraction, size you get out pretty good. Index refraction, not too well. Um, this is a variation for low optical depth. Typically, in the over the ocean, it's like 0.1 optical depth, aerosol optical depth, and so to get a good inversion for the index refraction, you need to have an optical depth on the order of 0.5, which is fairly polluted relative to what we usually see. Um, index refraction error is on the order of 0.05, so uh, that's like instead of being 1.5, it's 1.55 or 1.45 to give you a range. Um, the imaginary part, the error is on the order of 50%, but at least it gives you a guess. And the single scattering albedo I've listed there. Um, so here's an example. If you went onto that Aeronet's, Aeronet site um, of some inversions, what I did was look at uh, data from my Kika Biscayne site. Um, and I tried to pick a day that had a very high optical depth. It was just probably because we were getting a dust storm in Miami. So this, we're going to look at this June 16th. This is the aerosol optical depth versus time of day in June 2011. I just randomly picked one. Um, oh, that brings up a point. If you go to use Aeronet data, um, they have certain levels in terms of what um, quality control it's gone through. Um, the quality level one means that they just got it from the instrument, they just put it up, and you can see that, and that's great, except there's been no cloud screening. Uh, level 1.5, and remember this is an automatic instrument, so it's going to collect data regardless of what's going on in the atmosphere. So level one, no cloud screening. Level 1.5, an automatic cloud screening's occurred, and that data is a little bit better. Um, Level two is where this guy I told you about, Sasha Smirnoff, has looked 
basically at every level two plot in the world on that Aeronet thing, and he's said that it's okay. So if you, whenever you publish data with Aeronet data, they're always, all the reviewers will ask you, are you using level two? If you're not using level two, don't bother publishing it at that point. But this poor guy, Sasha, has been looking at everything. So anyway, so use level two. So this is level two data. Um, I picked this day that had a really high optical depth so we could see some inversions. So here's what the aerosol optical depth looked like during the day. Um, note, we have this normal sort of a thing going on where uh, 340 is this color, 340, 380, 440, 500, etc. cetera. The uh, aerosol optical depth decreases with uh, increasing wavelength. And it's actually not too fairly stable during this day. Uh, here's the inversion for size from four of the Almucantor measurements um, that the inversion told you looks fairly, there's this large component over here which is sort of, could be the dust. Uh, here's just showing you the products you can get from this website. Here's the refractive index uh, on the order of well, 1.4 is here, 1.5 is there. Remember, I told you that the accuracy is about on the order of 0.05. So basically, this is all the same in terms of their accurate, within their accuracy. Uh, here's the imaginary index of refraction. Uh, fairly flat, which I was sort of surprised at. But um, when you, this makes more sense. So this is the absorption in optical depth, and it decreases toward the higher wavelengths, and that's sort of what you would expect with uh, dust, uh, Saharan dust, which is what was going on this day, I think. Um, and here's the phase function inversion that you get uh, from the instrument, from their inversions. Note, relative to, we, have we plotted up Petzolds, or um, Kurt's shown you a bunch of Petzolds, or you've seen it during the week. Notice the scale here. Um, from 0.1 to 100, going from uh, 0 to you know, 180 degrees, the aerosol, because we don't have the large particles in the atmosphere, you don't get as much of a um, small angle scattering in the atmosphere in the phase function. So it's a, fair, it's a lot flatter phase function than, than we see in the ocean particles. Single scattering albedo, just to show that you could do it. Okay, um, so that's most of it. I wanted to just say, because you've heard a couple people talk about, say, absorbing aerosols and in terms of atmospheric correction, and I just wanted to point out why it's a problem or why we worry about it. So here's a standard atmosphere, a uh, pretty dense plot. This is the density of the um, molecular constituents in the atmosphere. Notice the density is the scales up here. It's a logarithmic scale, 1, 10 to the minus 2. Basically, the, um, the molecules, the density decreases exponentially with altitude. So most of the molecular scattering is occurring down in the lower part of the atmosphere. Ozone, I showed you stratospheric ozone. It's peaking up here, so most of its absorption is up here. Um, most of the aerosols we saw down in that last graph are down in somewhere right around here, this below this line. So when you look at that, the way we currently ha handle vertical structure when you're looking at atmospheric correction routines is you have two layers. You just assume that there's a Rayleigh layer up above and the aerosols are all packed down below. Um, and you can do your Rayleigh correction and you do your aerosol correction and there's a little bit of a Rayleigh aerosol interaction term but for the most part there's like two separate things you do. And for non-absorbing aerosols that works great. It doesn't matter where the aerosols are relative to the um, to the Rayleigh atmosphere. But now for absorbing aerosols um, if you have an absorbing, if your 
absorbing aerosol is here versus here versus there, it's going to have a large effect on the backscattering due to Rayleigh. Okay, if you have your if the aerosols are all below the Rayleigh, the majority of the Rayleigh um, backscattering, then you're going to get a large return from that part. But if the absorbing aerosols are up above the um, the Rayleigh component then the light coming in from the sun is going to have to go th down through that absorbing layer, then back up through the absorbing layer to get to your satellite. And so um, it decreases the amount of Rayleigh backscattering in that case. So what turns out is when you have absorbing aerosols, the vertical structure matters. And we don't really have a good idea of what to do with vertical structure with the data that we've got. Um, Absorbing gases are okay, like ozone, well, absorbing gases, ozone's fine for absorption because it's all pretty much above the molecular scattering, and we can calculate that really well. NO2, why I think it came up as a problem, why OPVG had to pay attention to it, is it's mostly tropospheric. It's almost mostly down in the middle of this Rayleigh backscattering layer, and so it's a problem and it's highly very, it's really um, concentrated near uh, the coast. We're trying to push to get our measurements in closer to the coast, closer to these polluted, polluted environments. Um, it also absorbs in the blue. And as you've seen, there isn't much light coming out of the water in the blue because of CDOM and such. So having NO2 there caused a lot of the, um, the atmospheric corrections to go negative, and that's where they came up with the idea they needed to switch it. And almost every technique I know to deal with absorbing aerosols is some sort of a spectral optimization technique where you use the whole spectrum instead of just using the measurements in the infrared to determine what the aerosols are. You use a model to determine t of the ocean and a model of the atmosphere and try to work these two models back and forth to determine what the aerosols are. So it's not a, a normal operational method, which is why there's been several papers on how to deal with absorbing aerosols, uh, but nobody really does it operationally. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things with that is that um, there's discussions at times about, okay, one large anthropogenic or not non-natural absorbing, somewhat natural absorbing aerosol source is Saharan dust. It 
covers in uh, the spring and such, it comes across from the Sahara, across the Atlantic. And uh, they look, people, biologists, looks at that as an iron deposition source. So maybe you get increased production around there. So there's some people that look at ocean color to try to get idea about whether you get enhanced production under these Saharan dust storms. The problem is it's an absorbing aerosol. So above a, um, below a dust storm, you've got a bad atmospheric correction. And the bad atmospheric correction is probably causing you to have a decrease in your blue signal because um, it's being absorbed there. But in general, what, if we see a decrease in our blue signal in a satellite retrieval, what do you think is happening with chlorophyll? I mean, it's cool. you think chlorophyll is higher. So basically, you're trying to look for a production event in a situation where your atmospheric correction is stressed pretty heavily. And you're going to see what looks like a higher chlorophyll production. Mm -hmm. Does that help in terms of the flat situation? Uh, yeah, I, I say mostly as a warning <laughs> to look out when you're trying to do it, that you're looking in a place where this atmospheric correction is stressed. Uh, then, I don't, yeah, there are different atmospheric signals in terms of the size of structures and such. But anyway, so that's, I just wanted to have that warning about absorbing aerosols at the end. And so that's what I had. So anyway, any questions, other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry about that. We decided la later last week, and I just finished it this morning. <laughs> Okay, so then you go to run hydrolyte and you say run from 400 to 700 nanometers by 10 nanometers, let's say. And so we're going to do this. And so here's, uh, here's 430 and here's 440. And you're really interested in the average over that band. Well, all hydrolyte does is it goes to your IOP model and it just picks off the values at the middle of the band. It's not doing something fancy like integrating the IOPs from 430 to 440 and using the average value and, you know, something fancy like that. And the reason is that these things vary slow enough that the center value is a good estimate of the true average value for unless your bandwidths get to be like 50 nanometers and you shouldn't be running hydrolyte at 50 nanometer wavelengths anyway, or, or wave bands. So that's, I get away with that in hydrolyte because the IOPs vary very slowly. And in the atmospheric stuff, you can't do that because you have individual gas molecules. So if you blow up an atmospheric absorption versus wavelength, and this is let's say 430 to 440, you don't have a nice smooth curve like chlorophyll, let's say. You actually have a lot of little curves like this. And these are on a scale, the width here are often like a tenth of a nanometer. So they're particular gases absorbing at a very narrow wavelength. And that means the atmospheric guys, when they do radiative transfer, they can't just go in and say, oh, pick the value at 435, if he asks for 
430 to 440, so here's 435, because you might hit this point, or a nanometer away, you might hit this point, and you'd get much different IOPs. So